This is Kana Arima, a child star trying to transition from her fading career as a child actor into the shoes of a professional adult in the entertainment industry. Except Kana's not an adult, in fact she's not even a teenager. She's a girl without a fully developed brain, weighing her validation as a person on the cold reality of how much she earns and how many fans she has. Over the years with acting jobs drying up, Kana attempts to pursue idol work, scrounging minimal concerts on basement stages, singing slightly off key for the 1% of her self-proclaimed fans who actually bother to travel and see her. She steps in front of the crowd, a bundle of nerves, and begins performing. And as the light shone on the audience, the tired, uninterested stares and shifting gazes cut into her like a knife. This is everything to her. She's poured her heart and soul into this, but as the song goes on, she begins to lose faith in herself as her small crowd becomes smaller. The light begins to fade, and with it, her hope of ever being relevant in the face of others again. Silently, she hangs her head to cry. And that's why even just a single image of an empty table is so painful, because with every unsold CD, every hateful comment online, every empty signing booth, and every article, it all feels like a fresh stab wound, like an indictment on her value as a person. The less she has written about her, the more disposable and worthless she becomes. Even at home, her mother is an embodiment of that disappointment, dragging her home life into a repeating hell. Kana is alone. She's unsure of herself. She's scared. And with it, darker thoughts begin to occur. This is Oshinoko, a manga about many things. Rebirth, attractiveness, idolism, acting, but most of all, a manga about lying. It's a narrative that twists and turns in ways you might not expect. It's an isekai, a mystery, a comedy, a drama, a romance, and as it goes on it will likely pick up a few more story plots to service. I've heard it compared to Perfect Blue, in fact, that's the reason I began reading it. And while they do share a number of traits, such as the whole dark side of idol culture thing, I actually think it's tonally closer to Erased, which is a fantastic series in its own right. I highly recommend reading the manga if you have some spare time. Many of the elements are similar to this series and are delivered with great writing, art, and characters. Now, Oshino Ko follows Aqua and Ruby Hoshino, the secret children of popular idol Ai Hoshino, the one seen on this cover here. Through these little interview panels and story vignettes, we learn the origins of the main characters in the series, and from there a whirlwind of intensity begins to pick up the narrative, leading to some of the most engaging twists and turns I've ever experienced in a single story. Now the first 10 chapters are crucial for a series to work. This is the send-off, the setup that ensures the future of the story will work out and maintain a good fan base, A debut, if you will. It's in these pages that you learn the whereabouts of Aqua and Ruby's past. In his previous life, Aqua was a lonely doctor in the Japanese countryside named Goro Amamiya who idolized Ai Hoshino following the death of a patient named Serena, who spent most of her time bedridden but loved Ai more than anything. One day, Ai herself shows up at the hospital, pregnant with twins. Goro is taken aback, seeing his favorite celebrity up close and personal. Over time, they grow closer. However, before he can deliver the baby, Goro is abruptly murdered by a crazed fan of Ai's. What follows, to put it bluntly, is quite odd. The recently deceased Goro wakes up as a newborn baby in the arms of none other than Ai herself, now his own mother in secret. Plus, he still has all of his memories intact, so what now? Well, that's where Oshinoko really comes into its own. This could have easily been just another one of those weird, incestual, lewd romantic comedies with questionable themes, but what we get instead is a pretty amazing character journey. We learn of Goro's new name, Aquamarine, which follows the all-too-realistic trend of celebrities giving their children really stupid and thoughtless names, though I suppose this is better than, uh, <coughs> some people. We also learn of Aqua's sister, Ruby, who just so happens to be that same girl who used to be his patient, Serena. They never suspect they knew each other before reincarnation, and this continues as they become related by blood and grow older. 
What starts from here is a story about Aqua and Ruby's lives together with Ai as their mother, and this is where you begin to learn about the series Poster Child. Ai Hoshino was an orphan scouted out by a small agency called Strawberry Productions in their efforts to establish a new idol group. Now Ai, through hard work, dedication, and fabricating an idealized version of herself that people could fetishize, becomes an instant success, raising her group B Kamachi to the precipice of fame. But even in the background, what Ai really wants is a life. She wants a family. She wants kids. And she wants to know most of all what love is. Through their childhood, Aqua and Ruby never lose sight of their love for Ai, and it transforms from just admiration as a fan to an active love for her as their mother. But here's the thing, we've only covered the first few chapters. In order to proceed, I'm going to have to go into deep spoiler territory. So if you want to skip, here's a timestamp. Otherwise, let's talk about the main catalyst for Oshinoko that sets everything in motion. The first big twist. In the way the documentary style interviews play off, it's clear from the onset that something is wrong. Ai's been living a double life, struggling to know if she really loves her kids. She says the words I love you to her fans, but she lives a life based on lies, or at least misleading the general public in attempts to cover her image and keep her good status as an idol. But how long do you lie before it's all you know, and you can no longer keep track of what's true and what isn't? This is the perfect blue thesis that the story more or less aligns with for a while, and I is sure of her persona, but not of herself. She struggles with the idea of telling Aqua and Ruby that she truly loves them because she worries it won't be real. Ai keeps growing more famous, reaching 20 years of age as her presence begins to influence the way Aqua and Ruby are living their lives. Ruby wants to become an idol just like her mother, and Aqua, well, he's not really sure what he wants. That is until the interviews begin to talk about Ai in the past tense, and at that moment I knew the story was going to take a very different turn. Ai opens the door on the night of her 20th birthday, only to be stabbed by a crazed fan, one who later commits suicide. Before she dies, she confronts Ruby and Aqua. She wanted to see them grow up, she wanted to be with them, but in her last moments at least she was finally able to say, I love you. With their mother gone, Aqua and Ruby are taken in by Miyako Saito, the active director of Strawberry Productions, and she plays a very integral role for the two. First presented as the selfish gold-digging wife of Strawberry's former director, Ichigo Saito, Miyako changes immensely over the series, eventually becoming a second mother to Ruby and Aqua and a great advocate for their dreams. They wouldn't be where they are without her. As we grow up with the two siblings, we learn how they change their demeanor. Ruby becomes an optimistic girl in modern day, eager to become an idol and make her mother proud. She very much resembles her former self in this way, living out the dream she's always had. With Aqua, however, things don't quite go the same way. Aqua was a direct witness to Ai's death, lying in her arms as she bled out. Overcome with grief and anger, his old self fades into his new body becoming reclusive and cynical over the years. He's convinced that his biological father, a man whom I never revealed to him or Ruby, had a hand in orchestrating her death. With this in mind, Aqua begins a years-long mission to find out who his father is, leveraging various acting roles in order to exploit information about his deceased mother that could lead him closer to the culprit. These are the breadcrumbs that form the underlying narrative for Oshinoko. But above all of that is so much more. Aqua and Ruby are high schoolers in the modern day, and with that their ascent into the entertainment industry is what takes center stage as Aqua tries to find answers about his father, and Ruby tries to make her debut as an idol in a tense and competitive industry. Speaking of which, remember that girl at the beginning of the video, the faded child star Kana? Well, she plays a pretty big role in the events of the story from here on out. Specifically, by the time you meet her again, it's been many years. She's now going to the same entertainment-based high school as Aqua and Ruby, but right away it's clear a part of her has never quite moved on with the times. Kana was once very egotistical as a child, but the disappearance of her fanbase and the small commission she stars in to make ends meet have left her feeling like a relic of the past. 
Sure, she's experienced, but that's a double-edged sword to her. With no real prolific work to her name in almost a decade, she also feels like a dead end, someone who no one cares about anymore. Khan is an interesting mix of emotions, and probably, well, almost certainly, my favorite character. At heart, she's still a kid, but her position as a veteran actor helps her become a sort of mentor to Ruby and Mem when Strawberry Productions decides to revive B. Komachi for a new generation. Of course, she's reluctant to step back into the music industry because of her past failures, but it's Ruby and Mem's infectious enthusiasm and upward push that eventually lands her there. So not only does Kana feel responsible for getting Mem and Ruby's idol debut to be a success, but for her it also spells out a second career that puts her back in the public consciousness. Once she accepts this and begins to think of herself as someone accepting of self-improvement, only then can she move on and become something greater than she has ever been before. And Oshinoko has many of these arcs, but it never loses its ability to deliver them in an engaging manner that constantly feels like the stakes are just rising a little bit every chapter. You never have to wait long to meet a new interesting character or learn about another aspect of media culture. And even better, the information you learn in the story very much pertains to reality, effectively doubling Oshinoko as not only a murder mystery, but also a guide on how to survive internet fame in the competitive world of entertainment. And this is where that little concept of lying plays such a big role in the series, as the whole of the entertainment industry is built on it. So let's talk about that. Favors for favors, IOUs, lies and fabrications, press releases, scandals, competition, these are the basis for the world of our main characters. As Aqua inches closer to the goals of exacting revenge, and Ruby, Kana, and Mem try to make it in the idol and acting industries, each with their own set of ever-evolving changes. Eventually, they meet another girl named Akane Kurokawa on a film set. Akane is a talented actress from a prolific stage school in Tokyo who is cast on a reality dating show alongside Mem and Aqua, and eventually a play alongside Kana as well. Akane is driven in her area of expertise, stage dramas, but struggles with relevance on the screen. Whereas Kana is insecure about herself but tries to hide it with egotistical remarks, Akane often feels out of her element and wears this underconfidence right on her wrists for everybody to see. As is the case, she gradually blends into the cast and becomes more or less a forgettable character on the show. This does not go well. Her manager is screamed at by the management repeatedly to do something about the lackluster performance, and Akane is left with no choice but to keep the company faith by boosting her relevance on the show. Eventually, this pressure to perform leads to a desperate Akane striking one of her friends on set and drawing some blood in the process, igniting a storm of hate online. Akane is not used to standing out on the show, and this soon puts her in an even more difficult situation. She's now getting more attention than ever, but not positive attention. Instead, the pitchfork and flames of angry fans flood forums with hit pieces. Overnight, the hate comments and death threats start streaming through her device, spreading like a wildfire over the vast internet. Akane doesn't want to talk about it. She makes up with the girl she slapped on screen, Yuki, right after the incident. She issues an apology, but it doesn't matter, no one will listen to her. Unfortunately, the mob online has grown to such a level that it begins to affect Akane's everyday life. She can't go out anywhere, she can't say anything, she can't do anything, and soon the constant stream of negativity viciously eats away at her, until one night in the rain, she stands up on the railing of a bridge and closes her eyes. She just wants it to go all away. All the hatred, all the evil. She just wants to disappear. She breathes, and then she lets go. This is unfortunately all too common in the entertainment industry or online in general. The constant hatred from those who don't even know you can feel more personal than a direct stab wound to the heart. And no matter how many times you experience it, no matter how many times you tell yourself you don't care what others think, and that you have people who love you, a little part of you dies every time you see a negative comment show up. And no one or any amount of words can prepare people for this attention. And you never get used to it. 
Luckily, Akane is saved by Aqua at the last moment, and she is eventually able to turn public opinion around with the help of her supporting cast members. She was lucky and came out of the incident a stronger person, but the truth is, this doesn't always happen. Unfortunately, in reality, many aren't saved like Akane. Instead, they end their lives with seemingly nowhere to go and no one to stop them and tell them how much they really matter. Instead, they go to the grave and the internet mocks them for it. And that's one of the hardest lessons to learn because at the end of the day, the only people who truly care about you are the ones around you, your friends and your family. And to survive in a world online, you have to condition yourself to know that and ignore the things that people say, even as hurtful as they can be. And as I write, I don't think I'll ever be able to ignore it. All I can do is give the people what they want and live my own life separately from that. This is one of the main themes of Oshinoko, the idea that our main characters are living double lives. One side sees them as actors, idols, and artists mingling with each other in the real world as flawed but real people, and the other is the illusion of themselves that they wish to project to their fans, devoid of any imperfections or infractions. Each character has their own way of dealing with this. Aqua tends to hide his emotion away from others, only showing it at times where it really counts or to those close to him. Kana projects a cute persona online, but in reality is generally loudmouthed and very opinionated, while at the same time being fun, professional, and even underconfident in a lot of rights. And Ruby is the only one I feel truly reflects her online persona through her never-ending enthusiasm and spark for life. Mem is cheerful online and in real life, but lies about her age to make people think she's still in high school. This guy, Melton Arishima, has very little confidence in his acting, but makes up for this by training to become fit and outdoing others in terms of stunts and general performance. And Akane really shines with stone-cold confidence on the stage, whereas in real life she is very cute and gentle, though insecure as I mentioned earlier. It seems to me that in this way Oshinoko becomes not just a coming-of-age story about actors tackling their industry, but it's also a guide and showcase of the difficulties that each creator faces in their position and how they cope. As each chapter ends and another one opens, everyone gets just a little bit better at communication and making their life work balance succeed, all with the lingering pressure in the back of their minds that in a few years they might be irrelevant again. With this need to perform, artists take up different jobs to keep in the public consciousness, and of course if all else fails, sex always sells, right? This is another big theme, as the main characters go face to face with industry executives poring over the figures that a bit of lewdness provides and trying to force it on creators. Some choose to do lewd work because it pays well, gets a good and hungry fanbase quickly and doesn't take too much effort to promote depending on how it's done. On this principle, it can be a good short term business plan to keep it relevant and gain devoted subscribers. A lot of cosplayers and VTubers do this as Oshinoko presents within its pages. But on the other side of this, there are problems. Those who partake in lewd content are likely to get more rabid fans who over fetishize and objectify everything about their existence, and it can come to affect their personal life as friends, family, and even fellow workers and agencies begin to look down on them. They may be a completely normal person who separates their business from life very well and just wants to be happy away from the attention, but this sexy online persona has begun to dig into everything they are. They might act lewd in front of the camera, but people want them to be like this 24-7 to the point where they avoid showing anyone their online profile in fear of ostracization or hate. I mean, I'm embarrassed enough to admit to my family and friends that I run an anime channel. Can you imagine what these folks must go through? And this aspect absolutely sucks. Too many times you're just expressing yourself and you get hate for it. But in a lot of ways, we can only control what we put into the world, not how people will receive it. I mean, remember what the internet did to Samsung Sam? She's just a cartoon girl, but Rule 34 got busy, and now she's come to mean something entirely different from what she was originally intended to be. In the end, all we can do is either withdraw from posting things that might be taken and warped by the media, or when that inevitably happens, deal with it in a responsible manner. Oshinoko presents several chapters where the main plot is just saving face for a network or addressing a controversy. 
In fact, Akane's arc is a great example, as after her attempted suicide, she and the others are able to turn her popularity around with some heartfelt and leaked footage that answers a lot of the audience questions on what happened after the slap on set. In Oshinoko, it's clear a lot of the time has been put into fleshing out the world of social media and the big networks. Every character feels real, no one is underdeveloped, and at one point or another you understand the struggle everyone from production to performance goes through, even those who oppose the main characters and make things harder. In the end, they have families to feed too, and they need the shows to work in order to pay the bills. Most of the cast in the series is pretty three-dimensional, being flawed but mostly with endearing qualities, even if they aren't always obvious. And one of the best examples of this idea is in the way Oshinoko depicts its main protagonist, Aqua Hoshino. Throughout the series, Aqua is kinda hard to figure out, and I often find myself unsure of his motivations. Sometimes I really like him, other times he can be really frustrating, but I think that's due to his own inner turmoil and how he struggles to live. He's essentially a man in his 30s, inhabiting the body of a high schooler, so there's a lot of nuance in the way he reacts to things. When Kana and him have a day out together, he already reserves a table and plans a route perfectly for the occasion, befitting of an experienced adult. When Mem confronts him about avoiding Kana after he starts dating Akane, Aqua at first seems peevish, uninterested and naive, until he explains that the reason he's avoiding her is because of a scandal that would emerge from him being caught or even photographed with Kana, a rising idol. He doesn't want her reputation to suffer, her future to crash, her fans to turn on her, or worse than anything, an attack to occur, just like I. It becomes clear over time that Aqua is much more than a shallow, edgy boy the manga could have easily made him out to be. Sure, he's got the looks and the gloomy demeanor, but there's a reason for that. He's the son of a model, so he has the genes to make him handsome, and being an adult in a kid's body causes him to feel out of place among his peers because he's gone through so much more and lived for so much longer. He finds it hard to engage with the immaturity and approaches his romance more like an adult than a teenager, taking things cautiously, overthinking, and even distracting himself from potential intimacy in an act of self-preservation. Deep down, he's still the Dr. Goro Amamiya, just now with a pretty face, many additional years to his life, and a silent revenge story. For Aqua, I is the only person he truly loved beyond all else. Ruby is his sister, and he cares for her deeply too, though not to the level of I. Even though he's well acquainted with the others at Strawberry Productions, he keeps them at an arm's length and uses them to get closer to tracking down his father. He's gated off emotionally, rarely opens up enough for you to see it, and as the story progresses you get the feeling that Aqua will never be happy, as his actions often border on self-destructive. Despite all of his success and his popularity, he always seems empty and filled with pain. Pain that he wasn't able to save I. Pain that eats him up and leaves him emotionally shattered upon seeing even a picture of her. Aqua is fragile, which is why it's so important that he has Ruby by his side. While she might not seem like the type due to her normally happy demeanor, behind the scenes Ruby slowly works to expose the killer of Goro and uncover more about I. She has an infectious smile and desires to become an idol and walk in the shoes of her mother. In addition, she is passionate, optimistic, and helpful to others, encouraging Kana to join the new B. Kamachi group and emotionally supporting a young struggling assistant director not much older than she is. Ruby also keeps Aqua grounded, which as a sister she takes very seriously. This relationship gets complicated later in the series as Aqua begins making really rash decisions on his own without consulting or keeping her in the loop about his plans, but both have their fair share of secrets that they hide from one another. Then there's Akane. Akane is a sweet and wonderful girl, characterized by her talent on stage and her pleasant demeanor off the screen. She's a person passionate about her trade whom Aqua shares some time with and dates for a decent portion of the series, though they never go too far romantically. Despite this, Akane is very devoted to him and even in his often cold treatment of her, she never forgets how he saved her life, telling him that she'll stay with him and help him find his father. The fact that Aqua can't trust others eventually causes major strains in their relationship, though Akane's got a few secrets as well. 
She is shown with the ability to nearly mimic Ai, as well as have some uncanny similarities and knowledge that few except the late idol and those close to her would have known. This being said, Akane is her own person and is genuinely hurt by Aqua's lack of trust in her as he goes on to get revenge on his father alone. And the last character I want to talk about is of course the girl who started this video, Kana Arima. Kana is my favorite character in the series as I stated earlier and I'm guessing will be a fan favorite as well among the community. She starts the series as a child actor, transitions into a jaded adult taking on acting jobs, becomes a successful idol in B. Komachi's reboot, but soon yearns to return to acting once again, and as such feels unfulfilled. And despite the fact that Kana probably has the single biggest L counter in the series when it comes to her unrequited crush on Aqua, it's still really endearing to see her hope bounce back whenever they have a good moment together. Her enthusiasm in those scenes is absolutely infectious, and it's hard not to love her. Khan is a fun character who plays both a heartfelt comedic and educational role among her peers, often giving advice and helping the others in B. Komachi as they continue to gain popularity. Overall, she's a wonderful centerpiece to the series. Following the main four, there's a plethora of others who are written in the same vein as the main characters with intricate backstories and context provided to their various struggles, like this assistant director who works really hard or this mangaka that must learn to accept help and work with others. And with all of that, let's move on to my final thoughts on the series. To me, the series is incredible in its ability to create a fluid narrative that is relatable, unexpected, and entertaining. It might not be a surprise considering author Aka Akasaka's resume, which most notably includes Kaguya-sama Love is War, but even considering the success of that series, Oshinoko stands on its own as not only a great piece of entertainment, but a bible for the world of social media and the media industry at large. The quality of the story is impressive, and the artwork is gorgeous, beautifully drawn by mangaka Mengo Yokoyari known for her series Scum's Wish, among other works. The art flows across the page, and even though 99% of the characters are pretty, it's easy to tell them apart and they have well-developed personalities beyond just, well, looking hot. Plus, for fans of Kaguya, there's a little secret that ties the two universes together, which was really cool to see. Fans are gonna love that. When I picked up Oshino Ko, I breezed through it in a little over a week, enthralled by the story and its many intricately written characters. The plot is great, the relationships are interesting, the media industry critiques are informative, and the illustrations grace you like the fresh smell of perfume from a beautiful and familiar figure in your life. To be honest, it's been a bit hard to write this review because I could just keep going on and on about how much I like this series but I think I've at least managed to share with all of you today why this work is so great and why I enjoy it so much. Aka Akasaka said he plans to retire from manga but will continue to write stories, including this one, and I wish the best of luck to him. He's absolutely outdone himself in this series and it's been a true pleasure to read. And with that, my friends, it's time to end this video. As always, thanks so much for watching, and let me know in the comments below what you think of Oshinoko. Like, subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next video.